A good start to how early years health visits can impact our whole lives. Drug safety, the testing facility helping to keep festival goers safe. Better choices, the council integrating well-being services to boost health. And a helping hand, the course supporting older adults to stay on their feet. Hello and welcome to the Public's Health Across the Life course, a programme from the Royal Society for Public Health and ITN Productions. I'm Natasha Kaplinski. During the next hour or so, we're going to be taking a look at the full life cycle of public health, from the care offered to mothers and newborns to educating young people in healthy living, the importance of mental health support in maintaining a healthy workforce and a joined up approach to promoting well-being in older adults. Join us for this journey through life to find out about the projects and the people who are making a difference. But first, I'm joined by Shelley Kramer, Chief Executive of the Royal Society for Public Health. Hello, Shelley. Lovely to see you again. So this year, the Public's Health Across the Life course. And of course, this highlights the fact that we have different challenges at different points in our lifetime. We're particularly excited by uh, this year's uh, film, partly because the life course is something that we're really concerned about in public health. What we really want is for everybody to have the healthiest, happiest life they possibly can. But there are challenges at different points in your life. So in the early years, every child deserves the best start in life. And for many children, that's not the case. So we need to have good programs in place, uh, make sure that every child is vaccinated, all of those things to uh, improve and protect the chances of that child have a good life. Of course, then we've got children in school and young people, and there are lots of challenges around risky behavior, um, education, understanding, and gaining knowledge about what's good for you, what's not so good for you. Middle ages, ooh, we could be really complacent about, you know, not eating properly and not exercising enough, and the stresses and strains of normal life with uh, mental health issues and, you know, lots of issues around that but what we do know very clearly is that we need to do more in our middle years to make sure that we have uh, the healthiest possible older age and that's really uh, important for most people. Um, that segmentation seems like a very sensible approach but how does it actually work in practice? That's very interesting because I think uh, local authorities have the responsibility for public health and often uh, they do, it breaks down into the kind of programs you might be offering, universal programs. So for example, the role of the health visitor uh, in the early years, giving the right kind of information to new mothers, uh, pregnancy, making sure that um, mothers know why it's important not to smoke or drink during pregnancy. All of these things in a universal way make it better. One of the things at the Royal Society for Public Health that we're really concerned about, along with colleagues in the field, is health inequalities. These are growing. And so some children have a really good start in life and they're usually from the wealthier families, but other children have really uh, a poor start in life and we need to bring them up. We need to make sure we have those services and programs in place around nutrition, education uh, and healthcare that really help all those children. So having identified some pinch points, presumably you're focusing a lot of your attention on the areas that are not being dealt with adequately. Childhood obesity is something that we're concerned about and there's, there's really uh, lots that needs to be done around advertising and promotion of unhealthy food and drink. And one thing we've done this year is an upselling, uh, highlighting the fact that this is happening to all of us, having a larger coffee or a offered fries with that when actually we haven't asked for it. We know the public actually don't really like this and so we want retailers and others not to be offering uh, these kind of unhealthy foods in an upsold way, upsell us some healthy food. That's what we'd like to say. Um, there's been some really the pinch points around being 
older and false prevention is a really important aspect of what's happening around the country now and lots of the fire services on their safe and well checks are really looking carefully to prevent falls and they're doing this by um, you know talking to people in their homes and putting in proper uh, equipment. Another area is the arts and health, which has really moved uh, this year into a prominent position. So helping older people with core balance is happening through things like Dance for Health, uh, helping lung capacity if you have COPD through choirs, community choirs. So there's a whole host of things that help people's mental health as well as their physical health. So having highlighted a number of challenges. What would you say is top of your agenda this year? Probably young people's mental health. Our young health movement and the work we're doing around that to uh, promote resilience in young people, to uh, help prevent some of the, the terrible statistics we're seeing at the moment about self-harm and uh, mental health, depression and anxiety among younger people. And we need to be able to cope with this. For adults, we've been rolling out a program across the UK called Connect Five, and that really helps people to work on their own resilience, to know what the, how, how to deal with the issues. And we need to do something more for young people in that area. Well, Shelley, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much you indeed for your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Every child should be given the best start in life and health visitors have a key role in helping to ensure this. In 2012, the Institute of Health Visiting was founded to strengthen the quality and consistency of health visiting services across the UK. But following recent budget cuts, the Institute is concerned that these vital services are at risk in England. Sharon Thomas finds out more. The early days and weeks of a child's life are precious and also critical to that child's development. I think the service is fantastic. I mean, it's local to me. It offers the way in which I need. Health visitors work with every family in the UK from pregnancy throughout the early years and beyond. They play a vital role from early identification and timely support to preventing problems becoming a crisis. All are qualified nurses or midwives before they undertake health visiting training. They work in GP practices, in people's homes and in the community, including at family centres like this one. We initially went to um, a couple for breastfeeding clinics as we were struggling with that at the start and everybody there has been really professional and really helpful um, and yeah, really helped us get over uh, a few issues that we had at the start. This family centre, together with five others in this area of North London, provides support for more than 200 babies and young children every week. Everything from weigh-ins and breastfeeding to advice for new families on things like housing and emotional support. We've had a few challenges um, and they've always been on the end of the phone or um, on the end of an email um, advising and supporting. The Institute of Health Visiting is a charity established as a UK centre of excellence supporting the 15,000 or so health visitors across the UK. However, health visitor numbers have dropped in England by more than 10% recently, threatening the effectiveness of their service. The work of the health visitor often goes unseen. However, the work they do with children and families can in turn have a huge impact on outcomes for society. Unfortunately, at the moment, the government has cut public health budgets and this is putting local authorities under huge pressures, which are resulting in some local authorities cutting health visiting numbers. And that in turn has led to some health visitors having to juggle caseloads of up to a thousand children. These health visitors are highly skilled public health specialists, often trained to master's level. They provide a universal service that is personalised to each family's needs. For example, they are uniquely placed to identify domestic violence, postnatal depression and relationship breakdown, and to prevent these issues from having a long-term impact on the child, family and society. 
Myself and the Haringey Health Visitors are working very, very hard um, towards trying to improve the breastfeeding rates for mothers and for babies, which would therefore benefit both of their health and society. And we find the Institute of Health Visiting a really useful place for resources. It's like a one-stop shop. We hope help mums with moderate to mild depression and anxiety. Um, and our aim is trying to get there as early as possible so we can support them right from the antenatal contact all the way until the child is five years old. Community work is pivotal to health visitors' work, seeing families in their homes and supporting the individual needs of each. Health visitors visit every family and you never know um, what challenges are facing families behind the door when you first go to meet them. And it's down to the skills and competence of that health visitor to be able to build a trusting relationship with that family so that she can best help them. Properly resourced, well-trained health visitors with enough time to build relationships with families are in a unique position to improve outcomes and reduce health inequalities for all families. I think they're really important from a maternal mental health point of view. Mental health is really big in the press at the moment, but I think the health visitors can pick it up before GPs can and you know it's easier to talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis than in a formal appointment with a GP. Whilst their principal role is to help ensure that every child has the very best start in life and the opportunity to meet their individual potential, their work impacts on the health of whole communities and in turn society. Child obesity is a problem that puts a strain on healthcare providers, particularly in more deprived areas. Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service's A Better Me programme is aimed at youngsters who are on the road to health problems in later life and makes them realise that a healthy body means a healthy mind. Lucy Siegel has more. Three, two, one, go. The fire service has an enviable reputation for prevention and now it's turning that track record into part of an innovative new course for young people called A Better Me. To the uninitiated, hose runs and ladder climbs might look like very hard work indeed. But for the Year 8 students selected to take part in A Better Me, this programme aims to promote a healthy body and healthy mind, helping them to carve out the right pathways now and in the future. That age group is really important because it's when they're starting to take their life choices, they're becoming independent, and what they start to do now will shape the rest of their lives. The first thing you will do is drag out the hose wheel all the way down to that cone. Meet Harry and his dad, Martin. After six weeks engagement with Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service, they seem pretty at home here. But has Harry noticed an improvement in his own well-being? What do you think it brings you? Uh, less depression, less anxiety. Because these aren't people I'd usually like, hang around with in school. But I feel like we've got a lot closer since starting a better me. And in this session, it's not just Harry who's put to the test. Put more effort in! It's just a great idea and it's a great opportunity for these children who perhaps find things a little bit challenging at times and coming from people that are so well respected like the fire service. For Amber, who has struggled with confidence at school, attending today with her mum marks a real milestone. It is hard, but it gets easier when you like actually do it. Okay, big breath in, you lady there. I don't really make a lot of friends at school, so this makes more friends. I have a lot of friends here and I will probably stay in contact with them. So the ladder climbing is a really, really important part of the course. We do it on weeks one and week six. It allows the students to balance their self-esteem and measure how they've done on week one and on week six. So we expect them to get to a certain point on the ladder if they want to and it's really important for their self-esteem to challenge themselves and for their peers and for their parents to see that actually this is really important for them that they can achieve something and they can go back to school and they can talk to their friends about it and they can say this is what I've done with the fire service and actually be really proud to do something like this. The sense of achievement is almost palpable and that is key to the success of a better me. Well done Taylor, that's brilliant. The fire service is maybe something that young children they would look up to in a way because it's a service that pro provides a lot to the community so when you get to have a look behind closed doors which is effectively what they're getting 
it really makes them feel special and as though they truly are part of something and I think that that sort of really helps them buy in to the whole program. The students all feel like they are working towards a personal goal which could be becoming fitter, including more exercise into their daily lives or it could even be just spending more time out of home doing something different. And it's clear it's not just the participants who get to be proud during the week six challenge. You have to use all your motivation to get to the end. Uh, I've gained lots of, con lots of confidence. I've learned how to eat well and I'm just more fitter. The benefits of this course will be seen over short, medium and long term. Actually through the long term effects you'll see people being less obese, more healthy lifestyle and will need health services less and less as it goes on. There are also some short term benefits that are obvious through the six weeks. They are re-engaged in school, re-engaged in physical activity and we're seeing some positive outcomes from the education sector as well. A Better Me may be a 10-week programme, but the positive outcomes for Taylor, his mum and the friends they've made are designed to run and run. Mental health services are facing a staffing and resourcing crisis. That's according to a survey conducted partly by the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. The BACP supports its counsellors to help them better serve their clients and looks to demystify mental health treatment for all ages, as Nick Thatcher reports. Whatever your age and wherever you live, talking about your mental health can help transform your outlook and well-being. And it's the role of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy to promote easier access to and best practice in the counselling services that can support you. BACP's role is about ensuring that the public can receive an evidence-based counselling, know that when they go to see a counsellor, that a counsellor subscribes to a code of ethics, that they're accountable. That's what BACP is about. It's ensuring the highest possible standards. And BACP believes this philosophy should begin in the classroom. For nearly 80,000 children and young people in Great Britain are reported to be seriously depressed. And around three children in every class in the UK have a diagnosable mental health condition. So come on. And yet counselling in schools has been shown to be a highly effective support for those who experience emotional health difficulties. I've been in counselling for a while. When I first went in, obviously not the best place to be in. Uh, very depressed uh, and a few other things. Uh, it's been really useful to me. I've improved a lot socially, uh, social anxiety, social awkwardness. I'm now less so, which led to me being confident in school, making more friends, being happier. Counselling has made a huge difference to young people in this school in terms of their self-esteem, their motivation for learning, their relationships at home, and some of the comments on the feedback forms have literally been, you, you know, you've, this service has saved my life. The British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy believes counselling changes lives. But whereas children and young people of school age in Wales and Northern Ireland already have access to counselling services, the association wants that access extended across the United Kingdom. I do say to people that the counselling service is our fourth emergency service. It isn't all about academic achievement at school and I understand what our core purpose is. But at the end of the day, we need our young people to be happy and healthy and you know, mental health issues particularly in this country, um, particularly amongst boys, have reached crisis point. And I think this is one area that schools can do a tremendous amount of good, but they can't do it without significant funding and investment. But it's not just young people who can suffer. In England, depression is said to affect nearly a quarter of men and more than a quarter of women aged 65 and over. And it's estimated that 85% of older people with depression receive no help from the NHS. Many don't feel able to ask for that support or their mental health can often be overlooked as just another symptom of old age. I'm a firm believer that it's never too late to come to counselling. And particularly as the challenges of growing old could mean isolation, loneliness, a lot of sadness and, and, and bereavement, and, and maybe issues of stress, anxiety, depression, all of those things 
counselling could help with. And it's giving people that belief that counselling could make life better. Sandra Hines may only be in her 50s, but years of unexpected physical ill health meant she needed to be treated on life support in hospital. It was there she began counselling, and her world changed as a result. It was just a, such a relief to speak to somebody that wasn't a family member, that wasn't a friend, that I could just totally let go and tell them exactly how I was feeling. And your impression of what counselling or therapy was about changed as a result? Absolutely. I feel that that therapist got me back to me and I, I didn't know which way to turn and my angel saved me. <laughs> VACP believes counselling changes lives and from school to later life it should be available to all who need it. According to NHS statistics in 2016, around 1 in 12 adults took illicit drugs, with many of these being consumed at summer festivals. A drug safety testing pilot at two UK festivals saw almost 1 in 5 users dispose of their drug once they were aware of the content, with the scheme being rolled out to more festivals in 2017. Louise Holland headed to the Boomtown Festival to find out how the scheme works. The famous British festival. Food stalls, bands, muddy revellers, making memories and... Everyone's going to do drugs in it because it's just what a festival is. Some people are inevitably going to take drugs, so we say, what do we do to reduce the chances of people suffering serious harm as a result? This is the Boomtown Festival in Winchester. Like most UK festivals, it boasts the normal entertainment, plus one new addition, a drug safety testing centre provided by The Loop. We set up The Loop in 2013, and the idea was to provide harm reduction advice and information for young people directly at festivals and nightclubs. And then what we found was that when we were talking to young people, they didn't necessarily know the drugs that they'd taken. So it made sense to us to add forensic testing to our service so that when we provided harm reduction advice for people, it was directly linked to the specific substance that they'd taken or planned plan to take. Now for some, this idea may be controversial, but not only is it getting the support of police forces and festivals around the UK, it's also gained the support of the Royal Society for Public Health. We are in a situation where drug harm in the UK has been on the rise for a number of years. The number of drug-related deaths are at a record high. But the death rate in the UK from drugs is almost three times the European average. Um, so we have been clear as an organisation that our current approach in this country to drug harm is not working. We're aware it's difficult for festivals. They don't want to be seen to have a drug problem, but they do want to try and reduce drug-related harm on site. So it's a balancing act for all of us, really. We don't want to encourage condone drug use but we do want to help reduce drug related harm on site and we think that this can help. But of course for many people the idea of walking into the loop to get their drugs tested could be a daunting experience. So what exactly happens inside the tent? Hello, have you got anything you want us to test for you? Thank you very much. May I ask you some questions about it? In like half an hour you can come back and we will give you the results. Hello, do you have your ticket number? Thank you. Sure, certainly. If you'd like to come with me round to the booth. Your sample that you believed to be an MDMA tablet um, was indeed an MDMA tablet. It was quite a strong MDMA tablet, so around 200 to 250 milligrams of MDMA. It's about twice the normal dose of MDMA, which is, as you can imagine, really quite a lot. And it's down to the volunteers in the lab to make sure the drugs are processed correctly. We have a spectral library that's got thousands and thousands of compounds in it and we match what bonds we're detecting in our sample to that library and then we can match it with the compound. After drug safety testing pilots at two festivals in 2016, 18% of users disposed of their drugs once they were aware of their contents. So what do these partygoers think of on-site drug testing? I think it's a fantastic addition to the festival. I do like, uh, I, go, I play in a band, so we go to a lot of festivals, and it's, um, it's a culture that's always going to happen. So if that's your thing, it's much better that you can find out if whether what you're taking is the right thing and whether it's safe or not. I think it's like interesting for everyone to know what they're taking. Obviously, it makes it safer, so I think it's worth doing. It's a good idea. Every festival should have it, and it shouldn't be something you should be embarrassed about doing. Some would argue that such facilities are actually condoning illegal activity. 
So to be clear, we're not saying drugs are safe. Drug use is never safe uh, in whatever form. Um, and we are not endorsing it. What we are saying is if drug use is inevitably going to occur, which it often does at a lot of these events, then we need to provide a safety net. If they don't take drugs, they're not interested in the service. Fantastic, they can walk on by. But if they have bought substances of concern, they want to know what's in them, then they can stop and see us. Still to come on the public's health across the life course, gaining experience how young people with learning disabilities are getting valuable skills for the job market. Working together, encouraging diversity in the workplace. Driving changes, the manufacturer creating healthy, happy working environments. And smoke-free, demystifying the benefits of vaping. Meaningful employment is critical to good health and well-being. And while finding your first job can be a difficult and daunting prospect, this can be even harder for people with learning disabilities. However, a new scheme called Project Search aims to change this. Sue Saville went to Public Health England to meet some of the Project Search employees. Moving into the workplace after full-time education is particularly difficult for young people with learning disabilities. But at Public Health England, such youngsters are taught transferable skills with work placements to ease that transition. The scheme is called Project Search, an idea that started in America and is beginning to make an impact here. The need is really great because with those that have got learning difficulties and those that between ages of 18 and 24, the likelihood at the moment of them getting jobs is about 10%. But going through something like Project Search, that changes to around about 70%. And we know that from a public health point of view, getting somebody in who has got a job and starting to get their self-confidence and a reason for getting up in the morning increases their health. And that's got to be good for all of us. So at first, when I started, I didn't actually realise how much I would enjoy working in a lab. But I actually really enjoy it because there's so much to do, so much work, and you're learning new things every day. And I think I've learned a lot of new skills because at first I wasn't very confident. I didn't believe that I could do something as well. But since being here, I've made lots more, made new friends, I've made a lot more confident. After training with Project Search at Public Health England, Gregory successfully applied for a job in the warehouse. I pick stuff, I'm delivering stuff. I want there because people order stuff all the time, every day, every day, every day. Do you like your job here? Yes, it's quite fun for me. Part of Public Health England's remit is to address health inequalities. Teaching employability skills in a setting like this to youngsters with learning disabilities gives them both purpose and an income, vital to anyone's well-being. A key finding of Project Search has been that other staff realise the value of these hard-working, committed youngsters. Just because you're a young person with a learning difficulty doesn't mean that uh, you know we have to make a job for you. We can fit them in uh, to a job that's already there. I think Project Search is, is a wonderful thing to be with. Um, I have to give you the support and the confidence to get so that you can use your confidence, those, your confidence skills, and uh, and easier to communicate with other members of the public and the members of staff around you. So I think Project Search has helped me a lot. Not only are those on the Project Search training course growing in the skills and confidence that will help them into mainstream jobs, but also the staff around them have learnt a lot too. They talk of finding a better ethos at work, of being more motivated, and of finding great satisfaction in helping to make a real difference in young people's lives. A win-win situation that benefits the wider community. With thousands more mental health workers set to be recruited by the NHS, the imbalance between mental and physical health services is being recognised by the government. This is particularly pertinent to the human resources consultancy firm Mercer, which says that the mental well-being of millions of employees is under threat due to the increasingly busy and pressurised lifestyles.
the British working week. A stressful commute, long office hours and chances are a boss who just wants to see the job get done. But with the workforce at breaking point, is there a better way to care for employees? Well, the team at Mercer UK think so. We operate at Mercer the, the, under a uh, consulting model known as the Wellness Barrier, and it's really important that, that organisations understand the health risks of their, of their people. And what we've seen is traditional benefits really focus on the 5% of people who, who are actively ill. Then you've got about 55% of people who are at risk. So these people, they, they might not have any symptoms manifesting, they're certainly at work, but they're not producing to, to their absolute max, and they're not thriving in their, their, their work lives. And key to creating a thriving workforce is fostering a culture of acceptance. Diversity and inclusivity is at the heart of Mercer's work and that's demonstrated here today at their LGBT inclusivity event in this together. Good things are happening but on the other hand there's still a whole lot of things that aren't good. I care very much about everything that happens for our people and that includes are we a diverse organisation that includes everybody so that's the other part that has to go with diversity and do we integrate everybody? How do we represent me and each of us and you as a whole human being? That's crucial. Why do we use a one-fits-all type of program? There is many, many differences. Women are cleverer, generally speaking, in accessing healthcare earlier than men do, but on the other hand, are also underdiagnosed in certain disease categories. And I could give you many more examples on ethnicity and differences in, in incidence of certain cancers, a propensity to certain disease categories. So we need to stratify our health and well-being program to cater for that. It's not just the physical health of employees that Mercer seeks to improve. Mental health is key as well. So events like this are crucial in helping companies care for all of their workforce. Days like today, having events where people have the time and space to, to talk about it, to listen to people who have experienced mental health problems and ask questions in a safe environment is probably the best way for managers and HR professionals to start thinking about the kind of things that they can put in place in the workplace. It could be that someone's going through a divorce or it could be that they've got financial problems or um, it could be that they, their child is sick and actually they're going to need support during those times as well. So for me, diversity and inclusion is broader and includes everyone. It's not just about the traditional minorities, it's that everyone is a minority in some way. Research has shown that absenteeism and presenteeism, that's being at work but not performing to your maximum, often due to ill health, costs British business 7.85% of payroll each year. That's £2.16 million for every thousand employees most organisations have a significant spend on those benefits that target the ill, so, so the private medical insurance income protection. What we're looking to do is improve the risk that, 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 uh, of the working population, so, so that those costs for those benefits reduce. What we also are going to see more and more is personalised medicine. Our employees are quite rightly feeling more empowered to ask for more personalised benefits. The same benefits that help a young female employee are not the right ones for a middle-aged male employee. And of course, a happy, healthy workforce isn't just for the good of employees. There's a financial benefit to business as well. This isn't something that organisations are doing just to be paternalistic or, or out of some altruism. There's a, there's a financial payback for organisations who do embrace the, the, the health of their organisation, boost productivity, boost engagement, and, and those organisations who do really encourage positive uh, health behaviours in their workforce see that they outperform the competition quite significantly. At the forefront of engineering in Britain for over 100 years, Rolls-Royce has built a reputation for quality, reliability and innovation. The well-being of its workforce is extremely important and it's seeking to be recognised as much for its excellence in health, safety and environmental performance as it is for the products it manufactures. Rolls-Royce is the jewel in the UK's industrial crown. It's been helping to power the world since 1904. This is Rolls-Royce's Heritage Centre. The company has a rich history and a world-class reputation for building power systems, and they want to take care of the people that help to build them. There are 30,000 parts in a large civil aircraft engine. This one million pound machine cuts engine components to size, is one of 80 making the workplace safer. The oil-based fluids used to lubricate the cutting process compose a risk to health. 
In the past, with the, the, the cutting machines we used to have, they were open to the atmosphere, so the, the cutting fluids and, and all the mists would actually go into the atmosphere. So on the modern machines, it's a sealed machine, so all those, uh, those mists and, and cutting oils are contained inside the machine itself. And because of this extraction system and the HEPA filters we've got, we're able to make it a lot safer. Workers used to manually smooth rough edges, running the risk of developing white finger. The machine now does this job, and it's more efficient, helping to speed up the process. The company employs around 50,000 people worldwide. They all do different jobs, from receptionists to engineers. People who are well and enjoy well-being in all its dimensions, are, they're more engaged, they're more present, they're more productive, they're more innovative, they're more likely to stay, they're more likely to tell good stories about their, their experience at Rolls-Royce. The company run an award scheme called Live Well. It recognises sites that create healthy, happy environments. They can achieve bronze to platinum standard awards, helping people with a number of things, such as working better, sleeping better, eating healthier and quitting smoking. Thanks for coming today, everybody. We're going to have a chat about our Live Well programme. These resilience workshops teach people how to face and overcome the challenges of their working day. We're seeing when people are setting meetings up, they're coming to us and saying, how can we make this meeting healthier? So they're asking for input into things like making sure that there's no bowls of sweets on the table, um, you know, what healthy eating options can we have, how can we have a yoga before an event, or do some mindful breathing. So we're seeing engagement coming through at all kinds of levels. So far, just over a third of Rolls-Royce sites have achieved a Live Well award. The aim is to have all the sites accredited by 2020. From the CEO down, everybody understands that well-being, part, quite apart from being the right thing to do, is a fantastic business enabler. Gita suffered from postnatal depression after her third child and turned to a 24-7 helpline set up by Rolls-Royce. I had a lot of family support and friends around me, but sometimes it wasn't really easy to just offload. So it was really nice to talk to somebody independent. They were really, they came across very professional. They helped me put an action plan together um, and they, they just helped me through that difficult time. I've had a number of communications from individuals who on the back of interventions that have happened at their sites locally, uh, that they've identified, uh, you know, either life limiting or a chronic condition, which is, uh, you know, they've been able to, to act on and added years to their lives. Manual workers were complaining of aching limbs. Rolls-Royce worked with them to solve the problem, redesigning workbenches to be adjusted. Each job contains something like completely different. So if, if I'm just doing like a patching, I'd like to have it a bit lower. Whereas when I'm doing an assembly, I do like to have it a lot higher. Of course, if you look after people's health, you look after business. We saw the improvement in productivity where individuals just naturally with the flow of work were quicker at doing the operations. Workflow coming on to, onto the station was quicker and easier. And just the fact that it was more enjoyable to work at the station um, is what increased that productivity and, that, and the morale of the area. Rolls-Royce's vision is to lead the way in creating better power. And for that, you need people who are healthy and happy. When it comes to public health, an individual's welfare is governed by multiple factors. Medway Council's A Better Medway programme offers integrated well-being services aimed at improving all facets of health. Robin Dwyer reports from Kent on a number of their initiatives. Chatham in Kent, where smoking rates are above average, but people here have an exceptional chance to change that. This shop is a stop smoking service where those wanting to give up can just drop in for one-to-one -one advice on quitting with a six-week plan. We find that, that people walk past the shop, they notice the branding, they'll see it time and again, and eventually they come through the door and talk to us. Medway Stop Smoking Service uh, is a very successful service, but we do find that the shop really complements what we do. Um, we helped, we, we saw over 2,500 people um, last year in 16, 17, uh, and we got um, half of those through the process of quitting smoking, which is fantastic. We're bucking the trend in Medway. It's really successful, but what makes it outstanding is the part it plays in the council's mission to make a better Medway. The Stop Smoking service is just one of a range of well-being services offered under the A Better Medway banner. Because they're integrated, it means that someone can ask for help with one area of their lives and end up benefiting from other programmes. 
A better medway is our way of integrating all of these services, support and information that people might need in order to help them make a healthier choice and improve their health and well-being in medway. We've got weight management services, we've got services and access to stop smoking, we've got services to support people improve their own mental health and physical activity and some of those are very practical. Key to the scheme is spreading the word among the community and many of these services are community led. Peter is a volunteer. Six years after a heart bypass and a new hip, he leads walks around this green flag park. I'm 70 years old now and I think that uh, the other people on the walk, it's made a lot of difference to them. They start, you know, walking, put one foot in front of the other and after a few weeks they get very good and uh, it's certainly improved their health. Me and my husband, it's the best thing we've ever done, um, coming out, walking, meeting people and it's good for our health, our joints and you know, we, we love it. Well it's for the health but also the friends we've made, we've made a lot of friends. It's lovely to do it in a group and as my friend said it's, it's a social side as well, you know we've made lots of friends and we really do enjoy it. And do you all feel fitter? Oh, oh yes. yes. From the older generation to the very youngest, a better Medway has services for all. The purpose of these groups are for new and expectant mums to come along and get some support, to have questions answered, for them to have one-to-one -one with breastfeeding supporters, just for them to get all the information they need to start their breastfeeding journey off. So what they'll do is they'll come along to their local um, breastfeeding drop-in where they can get support um, and we can give them that confidence then for them to go out. But in the community as a wider whole, it's just going to normalise breastfeeding really. And while mums and babies are learning and making friends, they can access other services if they need. Our midwife put us in touch with here and asked us to come along and said that if you come here then they might be able to give you some support. So we came here and Chantelle um, did a one-to-one -one with us and put us in touch with the local clinic and we've been here basically every single week until I went back to work and we're still feeding at the age of two so <laughs> it's, it works it's doing really well. <laughs> a better medway works for the community led by the community to take on health challenges in all their forms. We are at the cutting edge, I would suggest, of tackling some of these problems and we understand where we're going and how we're going to get there. And it's Medway as a community as opposed to just one public health department that's making that happen. From health walks to stopping smoking, breastfeeding advice, weight management and much more. A better Medway makes health services easily accessible, bringing them together under one banner and helping local people make healthy choices. Whilst the public are aware of vaping, they often have a misunderstanding of what vaping is and its success in supporting smokers to quit. If the goal of a smoke-free nation is to be realised, then smokers need to be given the confidence to make informed decisions to switch to a significantly less harmful alternative than smoke tobacco. Peter Griffin has more. According to government figures, there are nearly 9 million smokers across the UK, but almost 3 million people have switched to vaping. The risks to health are significantly less, and former smokers say it's helped them to stop smoking completely. I'm an asthmatic, so for me I got to the stage where I was finding it quite hard to breathe smoking and making up all the excuses in the world as to why I was coughing up. Um, and I luckily just met the right person in one vape store, uh, spent a bit of time with me, um, explained exactly what I needed. Um, and I walked out of the store, bought myself a coffee, uh, went to reach for a cigarette and thought, you know, if I'm not going to do it now, I'm never going to do it. And that was it. That was a 40 a day habit kicked. Well, vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking and the UK has a growing vaping market. Now it's the second largest in the world. And yet the NHS is still facing an annual bill of £2.7 billion for smoking-related deaths and illnesses. So what's stopping more people switching to vaping? In 2013, our colleagues at ASH did a survey funded by Cancer Research UK that found that around 7% of adults in the UK thought vaping was as dangerous or more dangerous than smoking. And that's now up to 26% last year. And it's gone uh, a very clear line upwards. I think there's a number of different explanations. I think there's a confusion about the science because the devices are still quite new. Uh, people aren't clear about what the studies say. Some of the studies, to be frank, are not well conducted and some of the results have been missing 
misinterpreted. If you like sort of tangy fruits, have you guys tried the lemonade house? You have that in so we've heard that uh, vaping is 95% less harmful than uh, smoking tobacco. So how did you arrive at that figure? A few years ago, uh, an international panel of tobacco control experts was brought together uh, under Professor David Nutt. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, make an assessment of the relative risks of different nicotine products. And on one end of the spectrum, we had nicotine replacement therapy and the risks about that. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we had uh, smoked tobacco cigarettes, and the risk is about that. Uh, and then we wanted to look at the evidence on other forms of nicotine, uh, like electronic cigarettes, and we concluded that the risk was about that. So bigger than nicotine replacement therapy, but a fraction of the risk of uh, smoking cigarettes. And then just last year, the Royal College of Physicians produced a report uh, which came up with pretty much the same figure. So looking at the latest evidence, they said, yep, that looks about right, at most 5% of the risk of smoking. The independent vape industry is already heavily regulated, but feels the government could be doing more to encourage smokers switch to vaping. Unfortunately, there is a mixed message when it should be a very clear message. And a mixed message comes from vested interests who do not necessarily see vaping as something that should succeed or they would wish to succeed. The media who sometimes rather superficially reports and exclaims which causes uh, the message to be confused. Um, and also the fact that the vaping population sometimes seems a bit obscure to those smokers. What we do need, therefore, is for there to be, firstly, a clear message from our government, from the politicians and the NHS, to make it clear that vaping is endorsed. The smoking costs the NHS in the UK £2 billion every year. Um, anything we can do to reduce the number of smokers will save money for the NHS. Of course, it's not just the NHS, it's social care, people not uh, losing hours at work, the effect on their families, secondhand smoke. So we need to deal with all of that. If vaping can help, and I, I believe it can, then it's not only beneficial for the individual, but it's beneficial for our public services as well. These vapors show a smoke-free UK is possible, but if an independent vape industry is to deliver it, further support is needed from the government. Still to come on the public's health across the life course, Talking points, training staff to have meaningful conversations about mental health. Breaking down barriers, overcoming the hurdles to physical activity so we can all enjoy better health. And going viral, how one leisure company spreads the message on contagious bugs. Around one in four people will experience a mental health problem each year and many more suffer with low mental well-being. Connect 5 trains frontline health and care staff to help people improve their mental well-being and signpost to more specialist support when needed. Carolyn Sim went to find out how it works. In health, prevention is better than cure, but that principle hasn't previously been applied to a problem which affects millions, mental health. Now public health specialists are training the nation's workforce so people can improve their mental well-being long before they hit a crisis. The programme is called Connect 5. Here in Chatham, frontline health and social workers are gaining the skills and the tools needed to help individuals help themselves. It's based on the counselling principles of cognitive behavioural therapy. It enables people to self-manage um, and, and to recognise how their own thoughts and feelings are affecting their behaviour, giving some guidance on when referrals to specialist services are required, but making people feel confident and equipped to support people with everyday issues that come up that potentially could affect their mental well-being. If you could just Hold your balloon in front of your face. The three-day course upholds the principle of making every contact count. The more skilled non-specialist workers become, the more they can reach out to millions of people and potentially reduce demand on other services. Peter Mackey is a recovery worker with Turning Point, which provides drug and alcohol services. I like that sort of move away from the medical model, away from doctors having control of everything and empowering ordinary frontline practitioners to do more. 
Stephanie Bryant is a social worker for Medway Council. I think it's kind of pushing them boundaries of saying that, you know, we need to get speaking about this and overcoming it and making it known that we can do things to support individuals. And Ruth Hardy is a community life planning coordinator for the charity Walders Laid Together. Connect Fondly in that situation gives me the tools, really, to go into those conversations and help people work through things for themselves um, and from there move into support within the community if they need that. Connect 5 originated at the University of Manchester and was further developed by a public health collaboration in Greater Manchester before now being rolled out across the country in partnership by the Royal Society for Public Health, Public Health England and Health Education England. We are looking to expand across industry, both business, private, go into larger workforces such as construction where we also know there are um, mental health issues. But really, Connect5 is open to any individual and any workforce who sees, as part of their day-to-day -day practice, a role and responsibility to be having meaningful conversations around mental wellbeing. If we're going to move the system towards prevention and encouraging uh, populations and individuals to self-care and have the tools and the, the skills to do that, we're going to have to work together across professional identities and professional boundaries. And um, it's always a pleasure to meet people who are really smart and some of the people behind this are really smart and care. The Royal Society for Public Health believes Connect 5 will help to make our population more resilient. It recognises the parity of esteem between mental and physical health and with the help of the wider public health workforce, it hopes to bring about change towards a happier, healthier society. Good health is about more than good health services. It's about the air we breathe, the work we do, the places we live, our relationships, and of course, the food we eat. The Institute of Environment, Health and Societies at Brunel University London is researching how common diseases are down to our environments and the way we lead our lives. Katie Haswell went to find out more. People are living longer, but illnesses like heart disease, cancer and obesity are on the rise due to a broad range of environmental and lifestyle factors which affect our health and well-being in ways we're only just starting to understand. These days we all get bombarded by conflicting information about how to stay healthy, what kind of things we should be eating, what kind of things we should be avoiding, what vitamins we should be taking, how to stay active. I don't know about you, but I find it all very confusing. To make sense of it, the Institute of Environment, Health and Societies brings together 150 researchers from disciplines across Brunel University, London, to understand the complex factors that make us sick in the first place. Our research is really about keeping people out of hospital, and that's both health and social care. Research on things like physical activity, reduction of smoking, also looking at the economic benefits of actually taking up those interventions. And then on the broader environmental side, it's actually out of the health sector, looking actually at um, the environmental sector and looking at environmental management. One area the academics are focusing on is unravelling the complex barriers underlying physical inactivity. I think people that are shy probably don't like to come to the gym because of working out in front of other people, but people don't take any notice. I'm 15, we're in year um, 11 now, we don't do that much of activity in school, so we only uh, have uh, PE once a week or so, so we come to the gym to carry on uh, the education. We know that social inequalities really make it difficult for people to take part. Um, the, so those people who are elderly, those people who are living in deprivation, uh, people with disabilities, some groups of women and girls, for example. It's not because they're not motivated, it's because there are complex challenges that people face. We want to understand those, but more importantly, we want to challenge them and change them to do something about it. The Institute works with the public and helps community organisations tailor their health and wellbeing programmes. We have a few Paralympic sports that we, that we deliver, boccia and new age curling, curling being like the indoor 
winter Olympic sport, but an indoor version. And we're finding the over 60s are loving it. They, you know, it's something they can get involved with. It's not too complex, but actually they can get involved within their homes and within the centres. Decision makers need to know if programmes are value for money and the Institute's evidence is invaluable. In the past, a lot of funding has gone into treatment um, and the NHS is obviously investing a lot in, in treatment services for the population. As the evidence base is growing around the value of investing in preventative health services such as physical activity, there is much greater emphasis and investment in preventative health services. So it is, it is research like this that Brunel are doing that really helps to build that evidence base and, and make that case for shifting from treatment to prevention. The Institute's public health economics research shows that prevention is also cheaper than cure, like a project where GPs advise exercise. We've shown that it costs actually less than £2,000 to get an extra year of free health in the population. When we roll out this program, which essentially involves the GP providing advice about people having to do physical activity, having to go to the gym to improve their levels of activity. And this is actually seven times better than treatments that are offered through the NHS. If governments are serious about reducing the cost of health services, they need to invest in research to identify preventable causes of disease. There are a whole range of factors that we don't know very much at all about in terms of their impact on our health and well-being because we simply haven't done the research. And, and a lot of the time that's because there hasn't been any investment in research in those areas. So there's a real need to do that, I think, to invest. The norovirus is a stomach bug that affects up to one million people in the UK each year. It is highly contagious, spreads quickly in enclosed environments and outbreaks can lead to schools, hospital wards and hotels having to close. Holiday provider Born Leisure, who owns Butlins, Haven and Warner Leisure, is RSPH accredited for their prevention and control of norovirus training programme. We sent Jonathan Gibson to Thorsby Hall Hotel in Nottinghamshire to find out how they are winning in the battle against the bugs. At Warner Leisure's Thorsby Hall Hotel, making sure guests enjoy their stay is everyone's priority. We have three brands. We have the Haven brand, we have the Butlins brand and Warner Leisure Hotels. Over four million people will holiday at one of the three brands I mentioned um, at some time during the year. It stands to reason that we're going to have issues. So we have a really robust policy around uh, how we deal with, with norovirus outbreaks uh, within the business. Past experience has taught Bourne Leisure it has to take norovirus seriously. If an outbreak gets out of control, it can force venues to close completely. The most important thing if you have a suspected norovirus outbreak is to take immediate action. Where you've got lots of people in the same environment, you've always got a potential issue with norovirus spreading. It's extremely contagious. Training and planning is absolutely critical. The people who are going to be cleaning up need to know exactly what to do, where to go to get the things that they need for cleaning up, and more importantly, how to prevent the spread from themselves to other people. That starts with induction training for every new member of Born Leisure staff. So this is pretend bacteria and viruses, if you like. Most people know what norovirus is, but they need to know how to stop it spreading. This UV-sensitive gel is used to drive home the importance of effective hand washing. So often what happens is people don't bother using soap or they don't bother really doing very much. So just a quick flick, you know, and they think, well, that'll do. Under UV light, I'm in for a shock. So what this is demonstrating is that if you don't actually wash your hands really well, then you could still have viruses and bacteria on your hands even after washing. A good wash later. You need to put those, your nails into the palm of your hands. Then you need to go between your fingers. I try again. Much better. It's Much better. Still, uh... Yeah, you've still got a little bit here. So if that were norovirus on your hands, that means you'd be able to spread it around the hotel onto surfaces which could be picked up by other guests. Getting that message across to staff is what the outbreak game is all about. OK, so we'll give one set of rules to you guys. You. It was developed by Bourne Leisure in-house to keep norovirus on everyone's radar. 
when team come to do the refresher training, they'll sit down and play the card game, which has a number of potential norovirus scenarios, and they have to pitch them into green, amber, or red, which are our stages of norovirus action plans. Vigilance is key to preventing infection, so even before an outbreak occurs, preventative steps are put in place, what's called the green response. That means guests are always encouraged to sanitise hands, and workers are reminded to keep a note when guests buy certain medications. A lot of our team may not have heard of it before, so it raises awareness about what it is and what to do. If an outbreak occurs and starts to spread, the site may move to Amber Alert. Menus and other items will be removed from display to reduce the risk of cross-infection. Managers are also kept in the loop, not just on site, but across the group. And at that point, we can contact the site and say, have you got everything you need in terms of equipment? Um, or do you need any support? And at the same time, we'll send communication out to all our other sites uh, saying, such and such a site uh, might have a problem, uh, do not travel to it and similarly people do, will not travel from that site to any other sites in our business. The aim is to try to contain the outbreak so it doesn't become a red alert. By this stage every infected room has to be individually deep cleaned. It's a time consuming and costly process which in the worst case can close a hotel completely. And what's the reality of having to kind of deal with an outbreak? It's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of communication that has to go into place with um, going from team members through to management, daily meetings, that sort of thing. Um, it, there's a lot of work to it to keep it under control. And that's what's so good about the, the Bourne Leisure system is that they're ready, they're poised for action so that they can tackle any problems straight away rather than waiting for it to get hold. A proactive approach to infection control, protecting both guests and the business. Improving the public's health is important, but according to a new report by RSPH and Public Health England, fewer than 20% of health professionals questioned collect the data needed to do so. The Everyday Interactions report aims to help healthcare professionals record and measure their efforts on public health so their work makes a greater impact. Sue Saville found out more. Every day, hundreds of thousands of healthcare professionals engage with the public in ways that can have benefits beyond their core remit. But their impact hasn't been measured until now. A new online toolkit has been developed to encourage this wider public health workforce to monitor conversations in daily situations that can direct people to improve their health. The online pathway is called Everyday Interactions and is designed to help benchmark progress. And that everyday interaction can be as straightforward as checking up on whether you smoke, drink, uh, how physically active you are, perhaps using uh, behaviour change uh, tools and techniques to, uh, to support people to, to improve and protect their health. It can also include signposting people to uh, local support services uh, where they can get more specialist advice and support. And in some cases, it can even include some form of delivery, uh, for example, uh, conducting an NHS health check. We know that only one in five healthcare professionals currently monitor uh, and capture data on the impact that they are having on the public's health. And we need to do more to, to support these healthcare professionals to do that. The system encourages professionals to do the right action, record it, collate the data anonymously, and then assess its impact. This could find out, for example, how a service helps people to stop smoking. How many people across the year has the physiotherapy service um, spoken to about um, stop smoking? Of those, how many people uh, did smoke, how many people didn't, how many people did you provide brief advice to, and how many people of your service referred to a smoking cessation service. And ultimately, we'd be able to model what the impact of that uh, would be in terms of the number of people who are likely to have attended, the number of people who are likely to have quit smoking, and what the ultimate health benefit of that and return on investment would be. Physiotherapist Lucy Knott piloted the alcohol intervention from the Everyday Interactions Toolkit at her specialist rheumatology clinic. She says it made the conversation so much easier. It's changed my practice profoundly. One lady said at the end of it, because she came out as an increasing risk of alcohol dependence, that her partner had 
been asking her to address her alcohol intake for some time and she'd sort of been putting it off but because she was coming to me with a knee problem actually she was coming after knee surgery um, she felt that she wanted to be referred on to alcohol services I was able to confidently refer her on so I'm hoping that that's made a big impact Measuring that impact is exactly what the new toolkit aims to do, encouraging the wider public health workforce to keep up and extend its great work. Still to come on the programme, cleaning up, tackling the issue of hoarding to improve fire safety, vaccines, taking on the fight against antimicrobial resistance and infections, and home run, the initiative helping vulnerable patients after they've been discharged from hospital. Fire and rescue services are coming across more and more cases of hoarding. Up to 1.2 million people in the UK may suffer because of an overcluttered house. The safe and well visits made by Northamptonshire Fire and Rescue Service look to help residents at home in order to prevent fires and improve their well-being. Marvereen Cole reports. Morning, Mr. Horsley. Kevin from the fire service. So come to do your safe and well visit. Good morning. Kevin's visit isn't just about fire safety. It's designed to help keep Mr. Horsley safe from other accidents and includes advice about avoiding falls and reducing clutter in his home. You don't leave them close to anything that's flammable or leave them there because you can actually get a horde of, a horde of flammable material on your actual fire escape, which is your staircase. At any one time, we're probably processing around 100 visits and I would say about a fifth of those are related to clutter or levels of hoarding and those referrals come in from lots of different partners or from people themselves or concerned family members. We work with a whole host of agencies across the county so the statutory agencies like our police colleagues, colleagues in adult social care and children's services but also smaller charities as well so charities like Home Start who work with vulnerable families and also Age UK for older people. An extreme case of hoarding in Merseyside last year. The elderly couple living here kept so many possessions they were trapped and died inside. The sheer volume of clutter prevented firefighters from accessing the property. Safe and well visits mean the job of the fire service is no longer solely about responding to a fire. Taking a community approach has led to a huge reduction in the number of deaths and injuries from fire. It's about improving the health and well-being of the people in Northamptonshire, ensuring they can live in their own homes for longer and assure, you know, keeping them out of the statutory health and social care sector. If we can avoid an older person having a fall, for example, they're not going into hospital, they may not need social care after that. And so there's also, you know, you know an economic argument for, for the things that we're doing. More examples of recent high-risk hoarding cases in the county. Sometimes traumatic events can upset the balance of life, as was the situation earlier this year for this mother of two who didn't want to be identified. Everything just got on top of me. I wasn't well. I was in hospital and I was really poorly. It took a lot, quite a long while to get over everything. And then I had to move and I didn't have much notice when I was moving. Um, and then on top of all of that, my grandmother died and um, a lot of her stuff had to come with me when I moved to my new property, to my new house. After a referral by social services, a trained officer paid her several visits. I found an extension lead buried in the kitchen, plugged into the wall and I followed the lead and it went up and over the top of the fridge down the side and then there was another lead plugged into that which went, came across the kitchen door down to the end of the kitchen and I found the reel which was still rolled up which we encourage people to pull everything out uh, under a pile of bedding plugged in with a freezer as well that's where a fire could have started so easily. Joe worked with the local council and they fitted extra sockets and she persuaded the mum to gradually clear the clutter. Oftentimes careful negotiation is crucial. 
it's very difficult because their perception of hoarding is perhaps not what our perception is and it's actually trying to build that rapport trying to encourage them um, and not try to make too much of a point that they have got a problem it's all about how we can try and adapt their ways and make it a safer environment for them all to live in on a personal perspective, I joined the fire service to save lives. It doesn't matter to me whether we save a life through medical intervention, through putting out a fire, or from preventing someone having a fire in the first place. I mean, ultimately, you know, that's what it's all about for us. Antibiotics are becoming less effective in fighting infections as bacteria are increasingly becoming resistant to them. MSD, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, believes that vaccination plays a crucial role in the prevention of infections throughout a person's life. Sue Saville reports now on the role of vaccines in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. There is growing recognition that vaccines are one of the key tools for tackling antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. Vaccinations help prevent infections, both bacterial and viral, and so reduce the need for antibiotics, which are all too often used inappropriately for viruses such as flu. The recent rapid rise of superbugs is causing tens of thousands of deaths each year in Europe alone. In any hospital, doctors can find there are few effective antibiotics left for some infections. Part of my working day is to make those difficult decisions in terms of which one do I choose. And um, after a while, they're no longer that useful anymore. Uh, those antibiotics have been rendered, if you like, um, helpless uh, in the face of resistant organisms. When someone says to you, we're running out of options, I can feel the bleakness in their heart and I can feel what's happening there. And I, you know, that's why I'm not why I did medicine. I did it to give them hope. An intensive care unit like this is on the front line in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. The use of innovative vaccines to prevent infections occurring is an increasingly important weapon in the doctor's armory. At the Department of Health, policymakers stress the urgent need for more vaccines and the effective use of existing ones to prevent antibiotic resistance as well as diseases. Nature, in the form of bugs, are winning the battle against humans. The post-antibiotic apocalypse is a horror story. It's going back to the 20s, 30s and 40s where you got a mild infection and it was not treatable, and then you died. We need more vaccines and better vaccine take-up in this country and across the world to prevent infections. Vaccines make our lives livable. In Britain, there's good uptake of immunisation for children, but less so for at-risk groups and the elderly, even though protection against preventable infections is needed at all stages of life. When you get to the other end of the life course, we know that influenza vaccination is available and needs uh, to be uh, taken. We do pretty well there. But there are other vaccines against shingles and against pneumonia in older people too. And so we need to be sure that it's not just our children that we prioritise, it's people whenever vaccines are indicated throughout their life course. Collaboration is key to tackling the global rise of AMR through vaccination. At the Wellcome Trust, academics work with governments and industry to raise awareness of the wider benefits of vaccines and ensure investment in developing new vaccines. Because vaccines prevent disease, you never see that disease. There are many people who've never seen polio or the, the symptoms and, and impacts of polio in their lives. Um, and that's a great thing, but it means we don't necessarily see the true impact and benefit of vaccines. Creating an effective vaccine is a complex process, lengthy and costly, even with fast-track approval and access partnerships. More vaccines are needed to protect humans and animals if antimicrobial resistance is to be thwarted, and global partnerships will be required to find solutions. MSD is taking a multi-pronged approach to combat AMR. We're certainly keeping a very active pipeline of new products. Hopefully in the future, we'll be successful in combating resistance as it emerges. 
we are working very hard to develop new vaccines for both humans and animals because we do believe that preventing infection is the best strategy for avoiding the use of antibiotics altogether. To fulfill that vision and combat the threat of a world without effective antibiotics, the work continues to develop new vaccines to reduce infections and help people lead healthier lives. All too often, vulnerable patients who are ready to be discharged from hospital are kept in simply because they physically can't get home. West Midlands Fire Services Back Home Safe and Well initiative means that difficult journeys become easier. But as Carolyn Sim reports, it's far more than just a taxi service. It's 9.30 in the morning and West Midlands Fire Service is responding to a call. But there's no emergency and no fire. The team are off to collect a vulnerable person from hospital and bring her safely home. We'll just make sure that she's got keys to the property. It's a new initiative called Back Home Safe and Well. Today, 94-year-old Betty England is well enough to go home but has no family to take her. OK. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Without the help of the fire service, Betty would have to wait on the ward, possibly for days, for an ambulance to become available. Ooh. That's it. <laughs> home. While they're here, the team will check Betty's home is safe from fire and other dangers. They can arrange for a second visit or call in one of the fire service's vulnerable persons officers who can work with other agencies to ensure Betty remains safe in her own home. What does it mean to you to be home? A lot. I, I mean, I'm home on my own by choice. There's nothing like it, is there? Um, yeah, I'm happy to be home. This new partnership between the fire service and Coventry and Warwickshire NHS Trust is easing pressure on the ambulance service and freeing up hospital beds. For every patient that we have in a bed on a ward, that means at the moment, in a hospital as full as this, that one patient can't move in from the emergency department onto that bed on the ward, and somebody else can't move off an ambulance trolley into a cubicle. So by discharging somebody early on from a ward or from the emergency department, it has a knock-on effect of our ability to assess the patient behind them in a timely manner. At Dudley Fire Station, the Brigade Response Vehicle is fitted with more than just firefighting equipment. It has everything needed to help someone who's had a fall. The Falls Response Team, based here, work in partnership with Dudley Council's telecare service. West Midlands Fire Service provide out-of-hours and weekend response to thousands of elderly people who use assistive technology, like wristbands and tags. Many of these people aren't on the radar of local agencies, so the fire service carry out a safe and well visit a couple of days later. We've got instances where the fire service went out after a faller, went out to somebody and identified that that person needed a smoke detector installed. A couple of days after the fire service had um, the telecare alarm had been installed, uh, the fire service had to be deployed because the person had a fire in the property. They treated the person for smoke inhalation and the commander said that if it hadn't been for the link smoke detector, that person would have died. So that is partnership working and that's what we do in Dudley. Not only are we removing sort of high quantity calls from the NHS from non-emergency falls, we're also providing that wraparound prevention service so the falls won't happen again in the future. Working with our health partners in the NHS and our firefighters, we've managed to diversify and change the way that we respond to incidents. So they will identify people who are vulnerable from a health perspective and then potentially will meet people in our day-to-day -day business and realise that, you know, they are vulnerable from fire, but the underlying cause for that will be related to a health issue. West Midlands Fire Service can not only get to you quickly when you need them, they can prevent fires and falls and they're making an increasing contribution to public health. Theirs is an evolving and valued role in the communities they serve. Greater Manchester has become the first region in England to benefit from the government's 2014 devolution agreement, taking control of decision making to improve the quality of lives for the 2.8 million people living there. 
Manchester Metropolitan University's Faculty of Health, Psychology and Social Care is at the forefront of evaluating the impact of health and social care devolution. We sent Catherine Jacob to Manchester to find out more. Greater Manchester, the first region in England to transfer power away from national government to local decision makers, with its own mayor to control the big decisions on policing, housing, transport and, crucially, health and social care. One of those leading the devolved health and social care plan for Manchester told me that a potential £6 billion contract, the largest in the history of the NHS, would ensure hospitals, GPs, mental health services, social workers and voluntary organisations would work together to redesign the service they provide. The City of Manchester is um, bringing together health and social care at a scale that's never been done before in the UK. And because we'll be designing new models of care and looking at new ways of intervening in population health and looking at prevention strategies, we will need the expertise of our university colleagues to evaluate what we're doing and to check and ratify what we're doing so that we can modify things as we go along for the good of the people. In the heart of Manchester, a place of learning which is playing a crucial supporting role in evaluating the impact of health and social care devolution. Manchester Metropolitan University, which is carrying out groundbreaking research into health and social care devolution in the region. Its aim to share its expertise and to work with experts within the community to improve the lives of the 2.8 million people who live here. The university's pro vice-chancellor of health, psychology and social care told me they're working very hard to ensure they're effectively training the healthcare workforce of the future. Manchester Metropolitan University are working in very close partnership with a range of health and social care organisations, both the public, private and voluntary sector. We are involved in joint research projects, particularly around age-friendly neighbourhoods and community engagement and we are working very closely with those organisations to ensure that their workforce is fit for purpose to deliver a truly integrated health and social care workforce. Yeah. Would you like your nails doing or anything? A recent research project Manchester Metropolitan has been involved in was the Teaching Care Home Pilot. The project worked with care providers, staff and residents to promote and support care homes to create a strong learning and development environment which aimed to enhance the residents' experience and support the professional development of care practitioners. Part of the project for Teaching Care Homes was to recognise that, that care homes can be a fantastic learning environment and. Um, that allows students to come in and see and view a different type of nursing, social care nursing, rather than the acute, fast-paced, high turnover hospital nursing, which currently the curriculum is probably geared towards. So that, that, that's allowed that partnership, hopefully for the future. The staff at Rose Court are very clear about their mission and say the pilot scheme and training they've received in partnership with Manchester Metropolitan has been extremely helpful both for them and the care homes residents. It's got staff talking more about how they find what, what ways work with different residents, what routines are better and it's just giving them more of a happy, happier and safer environment to live in. We do a reflective account every single day, um, so two staff members will sit together in the evening, have a chat, see how we think the day's gone, what's went what good, what's went bad, and then we'll see how we can resolve it the next day to make sure it doesn't happen again and the best way to get around it and what works well for the residents. Healthcare officials in Greater Manchester now have a unique opportunity to deliver care in a new way, on an unprecedented scale while tackling some of the poor health outcomes that blight the region. Manchester Metropolitan University will have a crucial role in the mission to bring health and social care back to the people. Falls at home by older people are an obvious concern and they account for a high percentage of hospital admissions. Hampshire Fire and Rescue Services' aim is to assist in reducing the demand on health services. Lucy Siegel reports now on one of their falls prevention initiatives, a course designed to help older people be happy, healthy and remain in their home safely.
The 12 week course on offer here is the first of its type in the UK to be run by a fire service. It's free of charge for participants and it takes place in fire stations across Hampshire like this one. Hello Nigel. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is very interesting. It looks more like a circuit training than a fire station. Yeah, so we're um, obviously here today with the steer course. It's a great opportunity for us to get people within the community into the fire station and working with our older um, participants in the community to get them to come here and run this unique course at the fire station. The Safety Through Education and Exercise for Resilience programme, STEER, brings members of the community together to learn about changes they can make in their lives to reduce falls and remain safer in their homes. We know that the cost for acute demand in the health service or 999s in the fire service far outweighs that of prevention. As a fire service, we have trained people to deliver prevention messages and prevention activities. They're also trained in physical education. So putting those two things together gives us a really powerful product. And after an initial meet and greet and talk, participants take to the exercise room to increase their strength and balance and build their confidence. Right then guys, stand by, go. This might not be what is perceived to be traditional firefighting, but it is natural territory for the fire service, as steer partner Jackie White from NHS England explains. There are um, significant common risk factors between fire, health and other public services. Um, things like multimorbidity, cognitive impairment, uh, obesity, physical activity, all of those things really contribute to increasing demand on services. So if we work better together, we can do much more effective interventions. The work that we've been doing with the fire and rescue services across the country has uh, really highlighted how effective they can be at identifying people at risk of falls. There is also a strong cost imperative as an ageing population puts pressure on finite resources. It's estimated that um, unaddressed falls hazards cost the NHS approximately £435 million every year um, and emergency admissions for people over 65 approximately 250000 every year so it's a significant impact. If we don't get serious support prevention in the NHS and with partners, we aren't going to be able to sustain the level of support we need to for people as they get older. It's difficult to believe it now, but six months ago, Alex tore the ligaments on her foot and ended up in a wheelchair, losing both her mobility and her confidence. I feel energised and I just love coming on the Friday can't wait to do the exercises, although they're quite strong, have to be to make you work your muscles. I think it does everything. We have the social side where we get together and meet each other. We have the presentations which have given us a lot of information and we've had the exercises which have strengthened parts of us we didn't realise needed strengthening. So that's a thumbs up from the participants but in order to fine tune steer and quantify its impact data is being collected and evaluated. So far the results seem encouraging. We can only speculate, we haven't got the data, but what is becoming apparent is that the fire service have an ability to target people who wouldn't normally engage with health services. They're able to get to people before they have falls and then engage them in a way that they are really excited and motivated and want to change their lives. Steer seems to be providing the type of positive life change that participant Alex can attest to. I will keep doing the exercises because it has given me back my life. I was an old lady. I don't feel an old lady anymore. Thank you for watching the Public's Health Across the Life course. We hope you've enjoyed the programme exploring public health initiatives throughout every stage of life. All of our reports are available to view on the RSPH website. The details are on the screen now. From me and the rest of the team here, Thank you for watching. Goodbye.